finding the location. Um, first time we've ever streamed it as well, so good to see a lot of familiar faces and folks who are always in the front row and ready to heckle me, which is always appreciated. But uh, good to see some new faces as well as we've got our season ticket holders, our Rockney folks here as well. For those of you who are new to this, you know, sometimes we try to keep it light as I open it up and then get out of the way for the folks that you want to hear from. And often that'll be uh, an old picture of Jack dressed up for Halloween or something like that. But Unfortunately, it's pretty close to performance evaluation time of year, so we're not doing any of that this year. So I was like, I've got to look for something else to, to open this up. So I was like, what can I do to kind of get a laugh? And I did have to kind of raise my hand and tell on myself because you all know the progressive commercials where it's you're turning into your parents and things like dad jokes. So I was like, how do you open this up? And I, it actually crossed my mind. I was like, you got to go with something about how, you know, I feel pretty good about our chances today. And I was, I was upset with myself that it even crossed my mind. I'm, I'm too young for that. So I thought of that commercial, so I scratched that one from the list as well. But just really want to thank you all for being here. Thank you all for the different ways that you all have an impact on the lives of our student athletes, for you all being all in on the Notre Dame student athlete experience and coming back to campus and supporting us in so many ways. So I'm just here to say a thank you. And while the spring game is an exhibition today, it'll be a lot of fun. The lineup for this Ask Jack is nothing like a spring game lineup at all in terms. We've got Hall of Famers, national champions, and then our fearless leader, who I'm going to pass it off to now, our James E. Rohr, Director of Athletics and Vice President, Jack Swarbrick. It's great to see you here. A little different setup for us. The back of the room is really the back of the room uh, in, in this setup. I hope I can be heard. Um, thank you for coming today. It's our first shot at a spring game, Ask Jack, and I'm excited to be able to do it. Um, one of the reasons is it, it allows me to sort of reflect a little bit on what happened since we were last together. And it's been a lot of success. It's been a, a bowl game win, a fencing national championship, two individual national championships there. Yeah. It's here for fencing, right? A three-peat. <laughs> it's not that Gia reminds Marcus every time he sees him that they now have more <laughs> national championships than football, but uh, they, they, they in fact do. Uh, a national champion in track and field that we'll meet in, in a little bit in this program uh, that helped lead the team to its second highest finish ever. Men's swimming just had its highest finish ever. Uh, in, the NC, in the NCAAs. Men's lacrosse is ranked number one. Women's lacrosse is ranked number seven. The list goes on and on. Uh, women's basketball is sweet 16, despite losing both starting guards uh, before they got there in the tournament. So great success. That success, of course, is a tribute primarily to the student athletes who achieve it. We have remarkable student athletes here, as you know, but also the coaches that help lead it. And I must say, having now had the opportunity to do some more hiring, um, both the head basketball coach and, and several positions in football, and the hiring we did the year before, volleyball, swimming, et cetera, I feel strongly that over my time here, 15 years now, it's the strongest complement of coaches we've had, overall, top to bottom. And, and I think that's really gonna help propel us forward into what is a challenging time. College athletics is more unsettled than it's ever been. And where it evolves to, what it becomes, is very much open to question right now. NIL, transfer portal, the NCAA sort of withdrawing as a regulatory body in the midst of all this. And there, there's, I inherit a perception a lot as I talk to people and go around discussing college athletics, that that environment is bad for Notre Dame, right? It's going to work against us because of all the unfettered movement of student athletes and all of the money that's now come into it. I think it's just the opposite. I think the more the industry moves in that direction, the more our distinctiveness stands out. And the more we offer an alternative to what everyone else is talking about. I'm seeing that in recruiting. I'm seeing that in the performance that I talked about a minute ago with the success we're having. It's not that I don't want those issues resolved. And as you know, we're very much engaged in trying to help steer the ship to a safe harbor here. 
Father John and I had an op-ed piece in the New York Times. We had an accompanying segment on the Today Show all about what we hope college athletics will become or remain. Um, and we'll continue to fight that fight. We'll continue to lead. But there shouldn't be any pessimism about the environment working against us. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine because we do distinguish ourselves in this environment. But we're going to be fine because what we offer is substantively better than what a lot of other people are talking about. It is still the proposition that coming here isn't an evaluation of what you're going to receive this year or next year in terms of compensation. It's an evaluation of what you get from the experience of being here that impacts the rest of your life. And this university delivers on that, and the people who come here appreciate that and live it. And I have the great opportunity today to have two proofs of concept to join us as guests. And the first is somebody who represents this university and its football program as effectively as anyone I've ever met. And before I go through all of the elements of that, let me just bring up Brian Young. Uh, thank you, Jack. How are you? Great I'm to see you. Great, great to see you as well. Have a seat. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Not too early for you, right? You know, we got a, uh, I think we have a very promising defense this year on football, and its defensive line is eight deep. And if this guy had eligibility left, he'd be the best defensive lineman we have right now. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like if I even bump into something, I'll fall apart. <laughs> yeah, uh, but he was, when, when he was here in 09 as a grad assistant, um, and they'd do drills, and he'd participate in the drills, I felt so bad for the players. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was not pretty. Um, well, welcome. We, we were supposed to have Bryant last year, and ran into some... Uh, Got some, awful weather. Some, yeah, <laughs> terrible weather, couldn't get, couldn't get here, couldn't fly in. Um, we were going to honor him at the game and have him at Ask Jack, and we weren't able to do that. Um, but instead, we, were, we, we took the opportunity to celebrate his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in his absence. Um, what was that experience like for you? Well, um, it was incredible. Just uh, one, when you think about the body of work and all the hard decisions and sacrifices that had to be made over the course of, you know, even here and then professional career over time, like uh, you, you see all of it kind of come to fruition. Just it was a well worth it <clears throat> in terms of just the sacrifice, the hard work and all the things, even the low points. And it's those moments that really grow you. And so when you have that flashback and you, you're able to go through that moment of like, wow, you're being recognized for something you did on the field. But what struck me um, as I went through that moment, which was incredible, was that I, I was so grateful for the people uh, that was surrounded, that was in my life, I was surrounded by. And it, it was just, a, it was an, an awesome time to be able to celebrate with them and uh, to be able to, to be there uh, at that time and, and to go along that journey uh, with some incredible people, parents, family, coaches, uh, teammates, uh, ownership. It was just an incredible experience that, uh, that I'll never forget. And so uh, a lot of credit goes to the people that have sharpened me in some shape, form, or fashion. And so I was just grateful to be able to share that moment with them as well. I told this story last night. Yeah, go ahead. I told this story last night, and I embarrassed them then, and I'll embarrass them again. But um, I, we all use the phrase Notre Dame man. And uh, Recently, I, I used it, and somebody said to me, what, what does that mean? You, you're always saying that. Tell me what it means. And I thought there in that instant, how do I do this? How do, what do I say about it? And, and it became very, very obvious to me how I could do it. I said, uh, watch Bryant Young's Hall of Fame induction ceremony speech. That defines it. And if you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor and do that today. It's easy to find. If you put his name in Google, it's the first thing that comes up because so many people have viewed it. And uh, a, a remarkable testament to him. Focused on your family largely, right? Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your family. 
Well, it, it was important uh, to me. I, that fe- that speech I kept, it was hard to get, I struggled, I'll just go, I struggled getting to that particular topic in that talk uh, for a lot of different reasons. I was going a traditional route and thinking, um, you know, the more important people in my journey and, uh, and uh, just also telling some football stories. And the challenge was also that it, everything had to be encapsulated in eight minutes, which was rare. This is the second year that they did this format. <laughs> and so the challenge for me was to be able to honor and talk about my family, along with thanking the people that were important in my life. And uh, my, pa- my family is extremely important to me. Um, my mom and dad um, lost my mom three years ago. She wasn't able to share that, that memory, but I wanted to make sure that I honored her in a special way. And then um, my wife with an incredible um, job that she's done. You know, I always say that, you know, when you look at coaching or, or playing, nobody does it alone. You always have a great support and she's been an awesome support. And she's been there every step of the way. And I wanted to make sure that uh, she was honored in the right way and that uh, she was recognized for the work that she uh, did over the years and the sacrifices that she made for me and for our family. And so it was important for me to make sure that she was loved, that she was recognized and that we saw her, I saw her in that moment because the stage also belonged to her. And then to recognize my kids too, um, just they inspire me every day. Um, You know, we're always challenged, we grow from being a parent. We don't always have the answers and it's always, you're learning on the fly. And so, um, you know, just to be able to share that moment with them who have, they have been my inspiration. So I wanted to make sure that I honored them. And then six kids, three girls, three boys, and we lost a son. And uh, in, in 2016, and um, my struggle, I'm sorry. Um, my struggle was <clears throat> before he passed and he was on his, his deathbed, um, his mom and I were talking to him and he, he was understanding where he was going, where the train was going. And his fear was that we would somehow forget about him. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't expect this. Um, and so, so I had this incredible opportunity to um, be able to recognize him and keep a promise that we made to him that we would never, ever forget about him and um, how special he was to us. And um, his time on earth, his 15 years on this earth was one of the most richest experiences um, a kid can go through. And uh, we were so grateful for his life and uh, just being able to be his parents. And so I made that promise and and kept them. And um, just an awesome moment to be able to do that. So. Thanks for remembering that. The challenge is now neither of us can talk. (laughs) Um, your, uh, Your dad role has another phase in it. Now you're the dad of a recruit. Mm. Uh, a highly sought after recruit. What's that like? That, that's been extremely, uh, it's been fun, it's been challenging, um, it's been eye-opening. Um, I'm just really excited for, for him because, um, you know, he came here, wanted a, a chance to come here in summer camp. And, and we're coming just to get an opportunity to hear a different voice because I, I coach my son and uh, just try not to screw them up. But we welcome, <laughs> we welcome, I welcome other voices, men voices, instructions in his life. And so we were coming here after his junior or sophomore uh, season just to get better and to get work and to see where he compares to other guys around the country. And uh, we did a one day camp and he came out and he put his best foot forward and he really did a fantastic job. Um, the coaches loved what they saw. Um, he vibed well with Coach Washington and uh, you can just see the instruction that he was given my son and the other uh, young men there um, and how he responded to him. And so he earned an offer and um, 
that gave him encouragement and hope. And so recruiting started from there. And then he got a couple more after that. And in January of this, uh, this past January, things really opened up and he got a ton more offers. So recruiting has really um, been interesting. Um, it's been eye-opening. Um, like selfishly, I want him to come here. And, and I, I just, he needs to understand and see it for himself. My experience, my wife was a graduate as well. And so my experience is my experience, and I had a phenomenal time. I came here as a young man, and I, I came as a boy, and I left as a, as a young man. And it, it helped me, it grew me. The relationships that I had that, that, that I forged over the years uh, was incredible. And my rich time with, the, with my teammates, my family, and this place, there are other people in this institution that make this mm -hmm. institution what it is, such a special place. And so that meant a lot to me. So for him to, to, to understand what he has here, it has to be, it has to make sense for him. And so having him here this weekend um, is special as well, because now he really gets to continue to get engrossed and understand what Notre Dame and the family is about, this institution and what it can offer you, not just for four years, but for the rest of your life, for a 40 year decision and that's what we're about. So um, he's been to some other schools. <laughs> I will admit that as a parent, you know, I wanna be fair to him that he gets the right information and I and my, and my wife ask the hard questions that he may not ask, but we ask him so that he can get the information. And so he's taking all that, he's a, great, he's a bright kid. Um, he wants it, it's his um, and he wants to achieve great things. So. He has a chance to do it here. Although I went to school here, he can exceed what I've ever done here. And so he needs to understand that. Uh, he understands the great education and the people that are here that are for him. And uh, I hope he, he makes the right decision. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> um, Coach, Coach Young and Player Young had a pretty good year, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so this past uh, season, um, we had a chance to um, play in the playoff game. We beat a team in a regular season that eventually won the state title. We worked our way all, we had some struggles during the season, but we got to the final game, the state final, and the team that we beat in the regular season, they beat us in the final. And um, so we had some unfortunate um, uh, results <laughs> this year, uh, but we're gonna keep fighting. Uh, we got some guys returning that I'm excited about and uh, we're gonna go for it. Well, that's great. Um, you, you mentioned the decision your son has to make. What went into your decision uh, when you chose to come to Notre Dame? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's several schools I went to and, and uh, this other school that was in Michigan um, <laughs> um, was a close second. Um, but, but the decider factor for me was even though Notre Dame was, I grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago, Chicago Heights, if anybody out there from Chicago Heights, whoop, whoop. Um, but it was an hour and a, way, hour and a half away from, from home. And Notre Dame really could have been in Timbuktu and I still would have went. And my decider factors, when I came here, there was just this overwhelming sense of family here. Um, walking to campus, uh, getting to, um, have relations or understand the coaches and build that relationship with the coaches. But when I got around the players and got a chance to, in particular, go to Nick Smith and Irv Smith's room, they weren't brothers, they were teammates and they were like brothers. And then being around the other guys, there was just this calming feel, uh, feeling that I had that overcame me. And I, I felt like this was home because of the family atmosphere, the cap compassion that these guys for had for one another. And just walking the campus and feeling this, uh, this sense of belonging and, and the welcoming. And so for me, that was the deciding factor. I knew about the education, great education. It was a great 40 year decision. And they were winning a lot of football games at the time. And I felt like I could you know, be here and I just felt like I fit here. But that was a deciding factor for me that it felt like family and it continues to. What are some of the memories that stand out from your time here? Other than meeting your wife, of course. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of them. <laughs> um, God bless, man. She's, way, she's my better half, for sure. She looks way better than me, uh, <laughs> for sure. And uh, she does a great job for her family. 
Um, memory. Um, one of my biggest memories is in my senior year, um, this incredible game that we had, uh, one versus two, and the buildup uh, leading up to that game versus FSU. Um, we didn't think, uh, as we watched them on film, that we could beat this team that was athletic. They were fast, um, and they just had a lot of playmakers on offense and defense. And so, and we were a pretty good t team as well, but we probably didn't match them yet uh, at this particular time. But, but we had incredible leaders on our team. And I, I tell you what, our coach Holtz, our coach Lou Holtz at the time, did a great job just uh, instilling in us, encouraging us, and building us up during the course of the week. And then we we're taking this message and we're we're believing it. By the end of the week, we believe that we can run through a, a brick wall. And uh, at first, we didn't think we could do it, but then the week it was like, all right, bring them on. We knew we we're going to win the game. It was just a matter about about how much and how many points we're going to win by. And so uh, beating F FSU in one of these uh, game of the century um, games and the first uh, game day event that ever happened on campus, uh, history was made that day. So we won that game. And then unfortunately, the next week we lost to <laughs> Boston College. <laughs> Yeah, so those yeah. those those two games stand out. Yeah, both I went are from the highest to the highest. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I mean, it was like we won the national championship, but we didn't. But we had a we had a mental breakdown. We didn't focus, and they played a great game. Not to take anything away from them, and we didn't make enough plays. We lost, and it just felt like one of the lowest moments. Seventh pick in the first round by a, an organization with a lot of Notre Dame connections, but about as far away from your Midwest roots as, as you could be. What, what was it like becoming part of the 49ers family? Wow, dude, uh, it was another opportunity of um, going to a franchise that, that felt like family. Well, ironically, um, my junior year, um, I was a business major, I got my degree in marketing. So my junior year, we're taking these classes in this new building, this state-of-the-art building called the, the Bartolo Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, going into my junior year, I had no idea what my future held in, in football and pros. And I just, I didn't see it that way. I was just kind of stuck in the moment of doing what was important. But that was, and then knowing about the Niners, like they were a great team. Joe Montana was there, Jerry Rice. Roger Craig had all these incredible playmakers and just the, the championships they had already won. Um, had no idea, you know, just the, um, the coincidence of, of being in that building and how things played out. And I became a 49er fan watching the Bears beat up on them and then them turning the corner and then beating up on the Bears. It's like, okay, I like this 49er team. So I was a fan. But to, but to be able to get drafted by a team at where I got picked um, is rare. Um, and I just felt like it was, I hit the lottery. Um, not that, you know, getting picked there, there's a lot of hard work and sacrifice and I'm, it's not luck, but to get to that spot and for them to be at that spot and me to go to that franchise, it felt like it was the most, um, it was a lottery for me. It was a lottery win. Uh, Mr. D Barlow and the, the family did an incredible job just building this um, top-down um, tradition of making people feel welcome. And so when I went there, um, I wanted to make sure that I did my part um, for, for an organization that really cared deeply for its players. And um, it was just an awesome time, great experience, and uh, I wore the brand proudly and was honored to, to have played there for 14 years. Well, you, you certainly honored them with the way you played and the way you represented them. If I'm not mistaken, the, the highest award they give, I forget the name of it, but you won it eight times during your career there um, for representing the franchise uh, in the way they want it represented. So that's great. I'm gonna do something a little different uh, than we normally do here. I'm gonna ask Brian to stay up here and bring another champion up talk to her a little bit, and then we'll invite questions of, of both of our guests or me. So I'd like to bring up the national champion in the pentathlon, Jaden O'Brien. Yes, 
Kommissar Dr. Hughes. So How much. are you? Great. It's great to be here. Say hi to Everybody. Brian Young. Yeah, Thanks congratulations. Thank you oh so my much. gosh. Thank you. I'll let you sit there. <laughs> okay, so th the first obvious question is why does anyone choose the pain of the pentathlon? <laughs> how, do you, how do you become a pentathlete? <laughs> Um, so for those that don't know what the pentathlon is, uh, it's five events in one day um, for track and field. So I do the hurdles, high jump, shot put, 200, or I'm not, not the 200, that's the heptathlon, um, and the 800. So it's five events, and uh, you get about 30 minutes in between. And it's, it's pretty tough. Like, I get this question a lot. And honestly, you know, I would just say I love the grind. I do. I really do. And uh, not very many people can, can do it. A lot of people get intimidated before they even start, if they've even thought about being a multi. Um, but I, I just, I love just the, the different events I can do and just being able to do like so many different events. Like, I don't know, it, it kind of separates me from other people, I guess you could say, mm, yeah. Take us through this year's championship competition. How did you feel going in? At what point during it did you think, hey, I'm gonna be the national champion? <laughs> So it has been a journey to get here. Um, I guess I'll just start my freshman year. So freshman year was the COVID year. Um, we social distancing, masks, everybody knows how that was. Um, I got quarantined four times and I missed about in total over a month of practice. Um, that was a really hard time for me. I, uh, cause I came in to Notre Dame, you know, like on fire, just ready to make a difference, ready to make an impact and just, I was ready to go. I was like, let me just do this. Um, but having to you know, stay in quarantine for that long, um, it was a challenge, but I accepted it. I, there were so many times where uh, I would work out in my room, so I would do like 1,000 push-ups a day and run on my bed, like stationary, like up and down, like on the bed, doing sprint workouts. If you saw me, you would have thought I was insane. <laughs> That's commitment. <laughs> so. Uh, Freshman year, I was leaving my last quarantine, number four, and it was two days before the ACC championship. And we get to the ACCs, and I'm warming up for the first event, it's the hurdles, and my leg just felt like off. I just remember feeling it felt like a block of wood, and it's my right leg, which is my, my jumping leg, my trail leg and the hurdles, it's the most important leg. Um, and as I was warming up for the hurdles, I come out of the blocks, and I feel like a snap, mm. and I was like, Oh no. And this is about, I don't know, 10 minutes before the start of the hurdles. And so I quick like try to find my trainer. She's not there. I'm like, ah, okay, like here we go. Um, so what had ended up happening was I tore my, uh, I tore my quad. Mm. And um, I didn't know it at the time. I thought it was just, uh, shoot, like I just, I don't know, it's just sore. So I took some pain meds and competed at ACC's, ended up getting second. Um, yeah, <laughs> just a positive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but Nationals was two weeks after that. So we get back to campus and I get uh, an ultrasound done and they're like, yeah, you tore your quad. And they're like, you don't, you don't have to go to Nationals. Like, we don't want to force you to do that. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I will be at Nationals. There's no way I'm sitting this out. So the two weeks leading up to Nationals, I wasn't able to do any event work, and that's, that's big, because there's so many things I do. Um, I wasn't able to run, I had a bike. Um, it, was, it was tough, because I'm, I'm this freshman, going into the biggest of, like, meet of my life, not having practice for two weeks, and like seriously injured. I'm like, okay, like, here we go. So um, the Nationals was in Arkansas, and I remember getting to the hotel, and just being like, God, I, I need you right now. I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but please help me. And uh, long story short, get to nationals, and I PR'd in all five events, placed fourth overall, set a new school record, and, uh, and yeah, so that was a great first experience at nationals. Um, so then after that was outdoor season. So track has two seasons, indoor and outdoor. The outdoor season, I'm a heptathlete, which means I do seven events. So you do all five plus javelin and the 200. And that's over two days. So um, had a great outdoor season and ended up calling for, qualifying for the Olympic trials. Um, and that was just unbelievable. Just competing against just 
such great athletes, but such great people. They were so professional. They were so kind. Because I'm just like a little kid, like compared to these like really big people. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, so that was great. So that was freshman year. Sophomore year, another, it was great season, won ACCs this time. Um, but this time at Nationals, I uh, had food poisoning. Yeah, so it was uh, the night before. I didn't like my routine, as most athletes do. You got a routine. You don't mess with it. Um, had my spaghetti and salad, but was thrown up the whole night. I remember sit, like in bed, like not being able to move. I had to get up you know, early for the meet, and I'm like, I can't even get out of bed. How am I supposed to run an 800? So... Um, so we get to the meet, I'm like trying not to pass out because like, you know, even warming up, it was just brutal. And my coach, I love my coach, Coach Z, he's amazing. But he was like, no, no, you got it. Like, you're fine. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, just let me do this. <laughs> um, so that meet in particular was not only like physically challenging, but also mentally challenging because I came in, I believe it was third. I was ranked third in the country at that point going in. And, you know, I, I'm... I'm a competitor, like I wanna be the best, I have that drive. And so I wanted to like win, right? And uh, the first two events didn't go great. I was like, I think I was literally in last place. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like how, okay, what are you gonna do? Like, what are you gonna do? Like you can either, either make this meet a nightmare or you can turn it into something that you'll remember. And so after shot put, which is the third event, um, I got some momentum back, had a lot good Long jump, and my 800 was solid enough to where I got bumped into fourth place. So I finished fourth again. So going into this year, I was like, all right, two fourth places, I'm done with it. Like, let's just go for it. And um, I truly believed, like, you know, I came into the season with really high goals. And I've always had high goals. Like, my goal is to be an Olympian, and I want to run professionally. Like, I have these goals, and I have the work ethic to get there. But I told my coach, I'm like, coach, like, I, I want to be a national champion. Like, I want to be a national champion. And he's like, I know, I know. I'm like, you got to help me get there. He's like, I know. <laughs> so, um, you know, the process to get to this, this championship, um, it was just as much physical as it was mental. I, uh, I developed a new sense of confidence because you have to believe in yourself, you know, to do great things. And, and um, so leading up to the meet, um, it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is an altitude. And for those that don't know, altitude affects running. You just get tired a lot easier. It's, that's just like another hurdle you have to overcome. And so the week leading up, I got so many, oh, like the altitude's gonna affect you. Like, get ready, it's gonna hurt, stuff like that. I'm like, okay, please don't tell me that. Like, just let me, <laughs> don't tell me that. Um, and I, I actually get altitude sickness. So I was a little worried that you know, this is like another thing that I have to deal with. Um, luckily, I ended up being fine and it was all good. But what changed for me this year, as I went into the national championship, it was I had my high why down. I knew why I was competing. And for me, that's to glorify God. Mm. I come from a Catholic family. I have five brothers, one sister, Irish Catholics. Did you let in, yeah? Um, <laughs> And so I knew that, you know, like, regardless of how the outcome went, I was just like, God, like, I'm just going to glorify you, and I hope it's enough. And that kind of took the pressure that I was feeling and the pressure I had on myself. It, it kind of it lessened it by a lot, and I was able to go into the meet, like, okay, like, let's see what you can do. Um, so, yeah, so that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> oh, that's, good. that's awesome. The, the certain irony in the fact that the uh, number of push-ups you did in a day is exactly what I've done in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned the family. You're sitting next to somebody who's the father of, of a big family. How, does the, how did the sibling dynamic work in this? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I come from an athletic family, my, my dad and my mom are both collegiate athletes at Bowling Green. Um, my dad played some years of pro ball. Um, and so my parents were also my coaches. Um, my mom was my track coach throughout high school. And that really made a huge difference for me. Um, so I was a big soccer player my whole life. 
And my freshman year of high school, I just, I was, I was just done. I was kind of burnt out of it. And my mom was like, hey, like, Jane, I think you should do track. I'm like, well, isn't that what people do just to get in shape for another sport? <laughs> and she's like, no, like, I think you'd be really good. And so I tried it my freshman year and fell in love with it. Um, and <laughs> I think I got more nervous for meets in high school than I do in college, it's weird. Um, but the whole time, my parents were my biggest supporters. Um, when people ask about my family, like, I can't stop talking about my parents because not only are they like my parents and they're like, like cheer me on and stuff like that, but they really like, they know my desire to be great and they help me get there. Like they send me podcasts, they send me articles like, hey, read this, read this, like look at what this person is doing. Like they're, they're great. You want to strive to be like that. Um, so that was huge. And in terms of siblings, um, so I'm the second oldest. I have an older brother. He plays football down at Ave Maria in Florida. And my sister, who is a freshman, uh, runs track there. And then you got four more boys. Um, and it's a, it's a great time. Honestly, like, I love being from a big family. We're super competitive with each other. Kind of gets out of hand a lot of the time, but, you know, that's part of it. Um, and they're just, they're, there's such, like, a, they're a safe place for me. You know, like, when I'm, when I'm struggling or, or going through something, like, I know I've always got my family and that, that makes things like so much more bearable because you know that you're not alone. And like being at a great university like this, like Notre Dame is one of a kind. Like it, it really is. And with like great power comes great responsibility. I'm sure you've all heard that quote, but like I feel really at like Notre Dame, especially being a student athlete, we are like given a lot and we have a lot of opportunity to do a lot of good. And that's what like I really want to do. And uh, and sometimes, you know, like trying to balance like school and, and track and traveling and compete, like it, it's just a lot. And uh, having like my family to fall back on and having two parents who understand what it's like, um, maybe not at like the Notre Dame level, but they were still like D1 athletes, like they get it. Um, it it's huge, it really is. You know, you, you're obviously a national champion in track and field and you mentioned you're, you're, you grew up playing soccer and I'm sure we're very, very good at it. Um, but the video I saw was of a basketball <laughs> star. Tell me about your basketball career. Yeah, so I was a big baller. I loved basketball. Um, <clears throat> I played varsity all four years, captain from sophomore to senior year. Um, and yeah. how many total points? Over a thousand career points. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, basketball was honestly like the sport that I could just not not worry about like it was it was just so fun like I could just do it and it wasn't like track where you know I had to win state and this stuff like basketball was just more I don't know it was just one of those sports that you could do to like de-stress and I loved it the video I'm referring to is a uh, I've heard it's a sophomore sophomore, yeah, I think year? It's sophomore year sophomore year casually draining a three-quarter shot Three-quarter court shot to win a, an important game. Yeah. Crowd, crowd went nuts. <laughs> it was, yeah, over time. I guess and she mentioned rival. her parents' support. There's a little, also a little video of mom running almost as fast as her uh, as, she, as she progresses down the track. So uh, <laughs> lit literally following her um, in, in, in all of that. Okay, one final question that we're going to open it up. Let's, let's use the heptathlon as the framework here, seven events. F favorite and least favorite. <laughs> Yeah, um, I get that a lot. Favorite, I would say, okay, I cheat a little bit because I have like three. Um, <laughs> that's, not, say, that's not a little cheating. <laughs> I would say my top three would be hurdles, long jump, and shot put. And then my least favorite, um, okay, I don't know if I would have a least favorite. The 800 hurts the most, so most people would say that. Um, in past years, I would have said javelin because I didn't know how to throw. You'd think that like having five brothers who all play baseball and football, like you'd pick it up pretty quick. But for some reason, I that part got forgotten for me. I don't know. Um, but yeah, now like javelins come a long way, and it's it's in a good spot. So I would probably say least enjoyable eight hundred. Yeah. Um, and I said that was a final question. One more major and residence hall. Oh, uh, American Studies major with a digital marketing and theology minor, and I live in McGlynn. That's awesome. I'm, I'm still searching for a student at Notre Dame who just has a major. 
<laughs> when I was here, you just had a major. No one just has a major anymore. Um, well, I'd love to throw it open for questions anyone has of either of our champion guests. I, I, I'm hard pressed to recall an instance where we had guests at Ask Jack that better reflected what Notre Dame stands for, what the proposition of Notre Dame athletics is and wants to be. So thanks to both of you. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Brian, do you stay in contact with Irv Smith? Uh, I do. Because um, his son chose not to come to Notre Dame. <laughs> well, and that was a big discussion. I think. Yeah, you know what? That's, I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't, I don't know if the interest was there from here for him at the time. And so, um, you know, his opportunity was at Alabama. They loved him more. And not that they didn't love him more. Like, they, did, they didn't like him as much here. And so he chose uh, to go to Alabama. I think he wanted to come here. I don't think he had an offer at the time to come here. Yeah. So had he had, he would have been here because he was, he was all in. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. I have nothing to do with deciding who gets it. <laughs> but, yeah. but Irv's a great guy. He's uh, kind of one of the salt of the earth guys. It's just a great um, teammate, friend, um, doing really good things um, in his business right now. So, yeah, he's a guy to stay in touch with. Sure. Two questions for Brian. Number one, can you do the album switch up? <laughs> uh, yeah, like probably in 10 like sets uh, at a time, like, it'll take all day. But she'd probably go 100, 100, 100. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, she's a phenomenal athlete. Um, my time has passed for sure. <laughs> my main question though, in recruiting now, if you go through that with your son, with all the uh, name, image, and likeness stuff now, how are other schools approaching it? Are they actually saying, hey, if you come here, we'll give you so much money? Yeah, we haven't. Um, had... Let me let me repeat the question because the, you know, the the question was about the recruiting environment today and and what the the young family is experiencing when they talk to other schools. Yeah, uh, it's mentioned. Um, no amount has been thrown out, um, and people talk about you know the collectives and the things that they may offer from that standpoint. But we haven't encountered um, like what would we do specifically for your kid. Um, but I know that's out there. But I told my son, you know, it's it's not about that. Like, like I understand where we are in today's age, and it is what it is. But don't go to a school because it's a transactional relationship. Because the transaction was made, you won't like it. The moment something doesn't go right for you, now you're in the portal. Like that's another topic, right? So, um, go to a school where you can see yourself on campus walking without the relationships of the coaching staff, without the sport, you gotta be there because you love being there and it fits you and it's gonna be an incredible 40 year decision. And so, um, yeah, so um, I know that that's there. Um, I think Notre Dame does a really good job just in terms of uh, just painting a good picture of, hey, don't come to Notre Dame because of this. And that, that's not what they're about. That's not we're, what we're about. Um, although there are things in place, but Let's understand, you're not going to make the decision to come to Notre Dame because your bag is going to be big. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Jalen, right? Is it? Jaden. Jaden, sorry. sorry. Uh, my question is, you know, um, all these sports in track and field, they seem so different. You know, shot put, you know, totally different muscle groups than the 200 is basically a sprint probably. Uh, how do you train for those such a wide variety of things where most people specialize? They're either sprinters or long distance runners or shot putters. Yeah, so um, practices are long. Uh, practices are around like three to four hours a day. Um, we break it up. So usually what we do is you take two events, two to three events per day. Um, so for instance, like Mondays will be high jump hurdles and a hard 800 workout. Tuesday will be shot put and jab. Wednesday will be long jump and another like a sprint workout. Thursday will be shot put again and high jump. So you, you kind of, you balance it, 
by doing like two different things. And it, it takes a lot of reps. It definitely takes a lot of reps. Like I, I done it a few times in high school, but nothing, not a whole lot. So my transition from high school to college, that was a big learning time because not only like do you have to understand the sport, but you have to get the technique down. And technique is huge, especially for events like high jump, javelin, um, honestly, all of them, hurdles. Um, so it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of just repetition, watching videos of other people doing it. Um, yeah, so I would say it's, it's reps. Is it, is it lonely? So luckily I have two other girls who do it with me. Um, so not really, but I guess like for me, I'm, I'm just kind of like dialed in during practice. So I don't, I don't really worry about the, oh, I'm not talking to this person. I'm just more like, okay, let's just focus and get her done. Because I watch our distance runners and there's like, you know, 14 out on a run. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. It's a little different for you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, Brian, uh, what are your thoughts on the transfer portal? Um, the transfer portal, I, I think that needs to be, um, and I'm, Zach may totally disagree with me. <laughs> um, I, I think it's good in a sense. Um, as, as I alluded to before about the, the transactional relationships, like if you don't, if you're not get to school for the right reasons and the moment something goes wrong and doesn't go your way, um, and you have an out and you get to change your mind. You get to take your ball and go home, so to speak. I think it's, it's good in a sense if, if, you know, there isn't an, an opportunity or a new staff comes in and they may not want you back for X, Y, Z reasons and they give you an opportunity to, to go in the portal. Um, I think it's good in a sense if, on the flip side, if there's a need and uh, there are some guys that are looking to go to another school because they have a better opportunity to play, um, there's a lot of benefit. I, I think there should be a, a one-time if you're an undergraduate, you can do it one time as an undergrad, but if you're a graduate, you can do it one time. So I, need, I think they, there may need to be a little bit of uh, kind of bringing it back in a little bit because uh, um, there's a lot of guys that are just doing it because, you know, they don't, they're not feeling a certain way and they want to change their environment and don't want to stick out the process. You know, back in our day, you know, that wasn't the deal. You know, you had to go through the tough times. Those were the those are the growth moments you need in your college career. You know, you, the hard times is what, what really forge and build your character. And so uh, when you don't have that adversity and you're able to make those type of decisions and, and move and go to another environment, um, it's not always good. It saturates the locker room. Um, if you don't have a solid locker room, it can. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of bringing in the right character kids too. Um, so. I'm, I'm a, I got a mixed bag of feelings about that. We institutionally we we have sort of an overarching principle that we try to apply, and that is we we want the student who's an athlete integrated into the university, so the experience is much like every other student as it can possibly be. So when we look at a number of these things, we ask ourselves if you're going to draw a distinction between one group of students and another, you better have a compelling reason to do it, right? So Father John in 2015 in the New York Times argued that student athletes ought to have the right to monetize their name, image, and likeness. Why? Because every other student on campus could. So why should this subset of students not be able to? That's sort of our governing principle, right? Now, did we expect NIL to come in with no regulation, no rule, and become what it is, which has nothing to do with name, image, and likeness. No, we didn't, but, but that's why we supported it. We took the same position on the transfer. Every other student at Notre Dame has the opportunity to transfer if they want to. Student athletes should have that same opportunity. Again, in, in, in theory, it was fine. It unfortunately arrived coincident with NIL. So now instead of a student making a decision because the coaching staff did change or because they had not wound up at the place they should have wound up in, they're being recruited away and into the transfer portal. You would not believe the amount of contact our student athletes and their families get from other universities, encouraging them to leave Notre Dame. 
it's a, it's a really unhealthy situation. Now, fortunately, most, the vast majority of student athletes who come here choose to stay. Uh, we have a much lower rate of students transferring out. We, you know, when you have a coaching change, we saw it in volleyball, we saw it in men's basketball this year, you'll, you'll get transfers, and we understand that. But generally speaking, we have very few. The reason we have very few, beyond the fact that we attract extraordinary people like the two people who are with us today, is that, much as Brian articulated, most of our student athletes pick the university. Yes, they pick the program, and yes, they pick the coach, but they pick the university. And, and that's a constant for them, and that's why they stay. Let's go back here. You, sir, who's looking around for the other person I might be pointing to. <laughs> My question is for Jack. One of the goals uh, of the transfer portal, I think, is to improve parity among sports teams. And I was wondering if you think that's an appropriate goal for it, and if you think it's effective that way, do you have any examples in mind where it is doing that? And is that good for Notre Dame or, or bad? You know, time will tell whether it produces any additional parity. The initial evidence is not very compelling. Um, across our sports, we're seeing more and more of a concentration at the top of the sport, right? I think part of this has to do with the way youth, youth sports now plays out in America, where, A, first of all, it's privatized, which was a huge mistake we made as a, a society. Uh, the, the, any of you who are old enough in, in my generation probably played in public leagues, in, in church leagues. You know, it was just, it was a public good. Now you got to be in the right club or with the right coach by the time you're 12 or, or, or you're not going to get where you want to get. That concentration continues. So those, the, the sort of narrowing that goes on in youth sports then produces a whole bunch of people going to a few schools in their sports. So if you go sport by sport in the NCAA and look at the national champions, you, you get a real narrow band of schools who, who get there. You get some great stories of teams who get into the tournament, but you know, Oklahoma's going to be in the softball World Series this year. I just, I'm pretty sure of that, right? Whether they win it or not, they're going, to, they're, they're going to be there. For all those years, UConn was in the women's basketball you know, finals, and they're, they're headed that way again. Our women's basketball program, too. So our fencing program, right? If you're a great fencer, we're the first place you're going to look at. So that concentration continues. I'm not sure the portal is going to help lessen that. I have a question for Jaden. Jaden, you said you wanted to go on and be a professional in your sport. Can you kind of walk us through how that happens and what kind of uh, you know, sponsorships or NILs you were looking for and how that all works? Yeah. So usually how it works is um, professional run runners will sign with different running clubs or different running like organizations. So um, you can like partner with Nike, Under Armour, Hoka, any, any of those like different organizations. And uh, basically, that becomes your job. So you just you travel the world um, and compete. And if you win, then you get like a stipend, like you get extra. But they'll pay you to represent them and wear their uniform. Um, on top of that, uh, sponsorships with like running like shoe companies or um, like Liquid IV or like uh, Powerade, different other, uh, what's the word? Other like food and and beverage companies and stuff like that that runners prioritize and use a lot um, by partnering with them you'll also get more money so it's kind of a combination of partnering with the right club but also the right like sponsors if that makes sense I, I don't currently um, and and we have some recent track and field student athletes are having great success as pros. Yared Nagus set, set a national record recently and he's having, he's well on his way to a great Olympic story. Uh, Molly Sedel, uh, the marathoner. So um, it's great to see that that's available and that they're able to support their passion very comfortably. Uh, congrats again on the national championship but you also mentioned that you have aspirations to be in the Olympics. Can you talk about what your next steps are as you pursue that dream? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the next Olympic trials is next summer. So um, after this season ends, so I, I qualified for USA's. So after the NCAA's in June, I'll be competing uh, in July at the USA's. And then after that, um, hopefully I'll either make a world team or U23 USA team. Um, after that is done, then my eyes, or my focus shifts to the Olympics. Um, so this summer will be a big training period for me. Uh, next season, um, it's going to be different because I'll have to target different meets around the country um, that like the world standard or, or different things like that that you need to hit to be able to compete at the Olympic trials and, and hit the Olympic standard. Um, that's like where they happen. So my journey next year is going to be different than years past. Um, I'll still be, you know, God willing, I'll qualify for the Olympic trials and, and go all at it. Um, but to make it to the Olympics, you need to get in the top three of your event. And for the heptathlon, um, it's challenging, but I believe it's doable. So uh, from now on until then, um, I'll be, you know, I'll be training as hard as I can and just getting as experienced as I can and, and developing the mindset that like I can do this. It's not like a, a far out there idea. Like I want this, I've trained for it. Like why not, why not get it, you know? So yeah, so that's what it looks like. And it's, it, it's very important to us just as we support the aspirations of someone who wants to become a great surgeon or a great business person to support these aspirations. And it, it requires different accommodations. In, in the Olympic year, our best fencers typically don't fence with our team. They, they, they have to go to competitions around the world to put themselves in a position to qualify for and, and be successful at the Olympics. We see it in track and field too. You just, it's a different schedule and, and it's important to us to support it. We've had several soccer players in recent years who can't be here at the start of school because they're with the national team in competitions. The university has been great at supporting that, figuring out how to make that work. Trisha Bali, our faculty rep, is a superstar. Um, and, and the faculty board on athletics helps us. But, but it's working together with the students. This is part of what they want to pursue and do. And, and we have to help make it happen. Anybody else? Yes, sir. No. Jaden, how do you balance three to four hours training with school? everything else that's on, on, on your plate? Time management, honestly. Um, you kind of have to learn how to deal with it. Um, I like having a busy schedule. I like having to like get from one thing to the next and like just constantly going. So um, I think a big transition for me from high school to college was, was the workload and, and how do you handle this? Um, luckily, I have great tutors, great professors, great teammates who you know, I mean, they're doing it with me, but also just great classmates who are willing to help me out. Or like if I miss class because I'm competing, I can get notes from them. So it's using like um, the network and using like the people I know and my friends um, to help me get through it. Because alone, like you can't, you can't really do it. You need people helping you out. Um, so I'd say time management and then also just using my resources. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to bring this to a close. Um, Can I say something real quick? Please do. Before you, um, I, wanna, I wanna say this uh, to Jack just, and thank him for, as the athletic director, for your, the job that you've done over the years. Uh, I've watched, I've, I've watched, I've watched um, your, your vision and the people you brought into the fold and how, how everything is, is coming to fruition. And it's amazing to to see the the, the changes, the forward thinking, and uh, just where our university is is heading from the athletic side. So thank you, Jack, for the job that you've done over the course of your career here. Uh, thank you yeah. very much. Um, I, I was going to note something I think a little similar, and that is the thing that struck me about these two extraordinary people, and I see it in everybody who who reaches championship level you know, who attains where these are, is they have a why that drives them. And, and you heard those articulated, right? It's not just I want to be good. 
they, they, they were motivated by very specific things that they wanted to honor through their athletic performance. And, and I see that in everybody who reaches this extraordinary level of being the best. And um, hopefully Notre Dame helps bring that out in people. But the truth is, the raw material we get to work with is pretty extraordinary. And this is a great example of it. Thank you all for being here and be Irish. <laughs>